Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfection Nails one more time, continuing our great playlist of pulmonology. In previous videos, we have talked about lung infections such as tuberculosis, pneumonia, lung abscess, etc. Today, I'll talk about a topic that drives students nuts. It's called mechanical ventilation. With that being said, now let's get started. First, you have to understand this. There are only three methods to deliver oxygen to a patient. Two of them are non-invasive. One of them is freaking invasive. What are the two non-invasive methods? Number one, face mask connected to an oxygen tank or any oxygen source. You put the mask on the patient's nose and the patient breathes in and out. But the patient is doing the heavy lifting, aka the work of breathing. It's not the machine, it's the patient sucking the air in and out. Next, face mask, but instead of connected to oxygen tank, now it's connected to CPAP or BiPAP. That's an actual machine that can pump oxygen into you. Why do we call it continuous positive airway pressure? Because normally your intra-alveolar pressure drops to zero. This CPAP will never let this happen because this can collapse your alveoli. It will keep it, let's say, at five. So it can never get below five. That's interesting. The third invasive method is endotracheal intubation with mechanical ventilation. You plug in this tube, endotracheal intubation, and it goes this. This is a patient that's on a ventilator. He's intubated and mechanically ventilated because we cannot trust him with his breathing because he has problems. And then we connect this tube to a machine called mechanical ventilator. If you know anybody who has been into an appendicitis surgery before or an abdominal surgery or a hysterectomy or whatever, they were on general anesthetic usually and they were intubated and mechanically ventilated while the surgeon was operating. CPAP is the same thing as PEEP but with only one exception. CPAP is non-invasive, PEEP is invasive. PEEP means you are intubated and mechanically ventilated but they are actually the same thing they keep the intraalveolar pressure positive all the time and will not let it drop to zero or worse negative when should you endotracheally intubate and mechanically ventilate medical emergencies when the patient cannot breathe because remember in any emergency situation we think about abc airway so we maintain the airway with the intubation B is breathing, we maintain breathing by the mechanical ventilator, and C is circulation. We'll see. Is there hypotension? Let's give IV fluid. Is there bradycardia? Let's throw some dopamine here. Is there like an anaphylactic reaction? Get epinephrine, etc. To know more about conditions where patient cannot breathe, check out my video called Ventilation, Hypoventilation, and Hyperventilation. The causes of hypoventilation are the same indications of endotracheal intubation mechanical ventilation most of the time during general anesthesia which is during major surgery what's the purpose of using mechanical ventilator during surgery it delivers the anesthetic drug it prevents aspiration syndromes and it controls pao2 and paco2 controls oxygenation and the ph two main modes of ventilation Continuous ventilation and intermittent ventilation. Continuous does not allow for spontaneous breathing. The machine, not the patient, is doing the heavy lifting or the work of breathing. Cons, asynchronous breathing. Translation, if you leave the patient to breathe, okay, at a certain mode, and the machine is breathing at a certain mode, this will lead to asynchrony. Therefore, only use continuous ventilation if the patient is sedated, paralyzed, or in deep coma because now... Only the machine is doing the work and asynchrony will not happen. One example of continuous ventilation is AC CMV, assist control or controlled mechanical ventilation. Next, we have intermittent ventilation, allows for spontaneous breathing. The patient can trigger it whenever he wishes. Let's say that you set the ventilation on 12 breaths per minute and the patient would like to breathe in between and would like to make it 13. No problem, but it will never drop below 12 because this is going to be dangerous. We usually use this if the patient is conscious and is able to take breaths regularly, which is a key. If the patient has irregular pattern of breathing, I'm not going to trust him, at least for now. What can you as a doctor control in a mechanical ventilator? Actually, a lot. And as Dr. Stephen Covey said, you take control of that which you can control. 
you can control the volume, the pressure, the rate, the flow rate, the oxygen, and who's going to control the breathing, the machine or the flesh and blood human being. Volume, tidal volume, how much air would you like to get in and out of the patient? What is a tidal volume? You're going to have to watch my previous video on pulmonary function test. Pressure, how much pressure would you like to give the patient? Rate, how fast? This is the respiratory rate. Normally, it's 12 to like 18 or 10 to 18, something like that. But now we are controlling the rate, not the patient. Flow rate. Flow is volume over time. How fast would you like to push the volume of air into the patient? How much oxygen would you like to get? In some cases of hypoxia, when there is less oxygen, we should deliver more oxygen. Normally, the FiO2 is 21%. There is 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. All right, we can do FiO2, let's say. 50%. Wow, that's a lot of oxygen. Which, like anything in life, has its pros and cons. Combine any set of these BS stuff and you will get something called the mode. That's why you have an infinite number of probabilities. You can have low volume with high pressure, high rate, low flow rate, high oxygen, and the patient is going to control. Or you can get like an average volume and a high pressure and a low rate and a high flow rate and a high oxygen and that's another probability and you multiply the probabilities together you get like a lot of stuff there are some of the famous modes assist control or continuous mandatory ventilation this is volume control as i'll discuss later pressure control is the opposite instead of controlling the volume you control the pressure pressure support is slightly different from pressure control cpap or peep again cpap is the same thing as peep with only one exception cpap is non-invasive peep is invasive and something called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation which is an intermittent ventilation which brings us to a very important concept called lung compliance compliance is a measure of distensibility or expansibility of the lung like for dummies how easy is it to expand this lung and compliance equals change in volume over change in pressure a lung is called to be compliance when it expands a big deal with only a slight pressure. That was a very sophisticated sentence. If the volume is constant, the relation between compliance and pressure is inverse. So, when compliance decreases, it means that pressure increased. Okay, we get it. What else? If the pressure is constant, now it's the opposite. There is a direct correlation between compliance and volume if, if compliance decreased it means that the volume has decreased we get it so you can start a patient on a ventilator and then he will develop a lung pathology that will decrease compliance how would you spot the decreased compliance it depends if the volume is constant decrease compliance i will detect it if i see the pressure increased but what if the pressure is constant? How can you detect that there is a pathology decreasing the lung compliance? The volume is decreasing. And both of these can set alarms if they go too far. And you hear it in the hospital all the time. Beep, beep, beep. So that the nurse can leave her Instagram page and go see the patient. What's going on here? I'm a big fan of technology and this software. Like Max Planck has just changed the world of physics forever. Pressure control versus volume control. What is volume control? You control or set the volume. So I'll set the volume at a certain limit on the stupid machine called ventilator. And then you keep an eye on the pressure, the other variable. If pressure starts to increase, it means that compliance is decreasing. There is a lung pathology, baby. When the pressure increases too much, an alarm will just go off so that the doctor can stop searching for his Ferrari keys and go save the patient's life. Pressure control is the opposite. You control or set the pressure and keep an eye on the other variable called volume. If volume starts to decrease, now compliance is decreasing. There is a pathology. When volume decreases too much, an alarm will go off. How is that hard? Now assist control or continuous mandatory ventilation. It's continuous and assist control. Think about it as it's a volume control. You control the volume and keep an eye on the pressure. The patient is doing the work of breathing. Fine. The volume control, you set the volume and keep an eye on the pressure. When it changes, when the pressure increases, it means compliance is decreasing, which is bad news. You give orders 
for the ventilator mode as this. Okay, doctor. Well, tell me what's the order so that I can turn the ventilator on and set it. Okay. At, regarding the mode, I would like it to be assist control. All right. Would you like some respiratory rate with that? Yes. At 14. How about your tidal volume? Sit it at 500, please. How about FiO2? 40% oxygen. How about PEEP? Positive and expiratory pressure? 5. Do not let the intraalveolar pressure drop below 5 because this is dangerous. We would like to keep those alveoli open and breathing. Pay close attention. 1 and 2 control the PCO2. 3 and 4 contains the oxygen say we have a patient who is hypoventilating his pco2 is increasing therefore his ph is decreasing and he is having respiratory acidosis what should you do okay you can control one and two increase the respiratory rate and the tidal volume so that the patient can do like this <sighs> this washes out the co2 and increases the ph and back to normal Let's say that there is a patient with hypoxemia, his P, small a, O2, instead of being 100, I don't know, it's 50. Oops! What should you do? Control 3 and 4. Increase the FiO2 and the PEEP. Increase the oxygen delivery and do not let this poor alveolus collapse because we need every single one of them. Pressure control. The patient is doing the work of breathing. You can set the respiratory rate. Now it's pressure control. So you control the pressure and keep an eye on the volume. It's going to change. It means compliance is changing. Pressure support is different. You only control the pressure during inhalation. That's why we call it support. It's not during inhalation and exhalation and the patient has no free will. It's only support. Sir, you do the heavy lifting. The machine can only assist you. Since it's called pressure support, the patient initiates each breath the patient triggers the vent. Since it's called support, you do not set the rate. The patient does. CPAP versus PEEP. Again, they are the same thing. They keep the intraalveolar pressure positive at all time. They do not let it fall to zero, let alone negative. CPAP has the same mode as PEEP. The difference is that CPAP is non-invasive. PEEP is invasive. This is just an oxygen mask containing uh, connected to CPAP without intubation. PEEP, usually the patient is intubated and on the mechanical ventilator. That's why CPAP is non-invasive. The mask on your nose is non-invasive. Oh, it's invading. Invading what? Your privacy? Shut up. But here, when the tube is coming through your mouth and into the trachea and staying there, that's invasive, baby. In CPAP or PEEP, the ventilator is doing the work of breathing. It's pressure control. But the pressure is always positive. It does not reach zero, not to mention negative. Pros, it maintains the airway open. CPAP is excellent for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. That's an exam question. Boyle's Law, very famous, very important, explains a lot of stuff in life. Thank you, Robert Boyle. Okay, the pressure of gas is inversely proportional to its volume, provided that the temperature remains constant. What the flip does that mean? Okay, it means like this. The pressure of the gas is here, and the volume of the gas is here. Pressure is inversely related to volume, and volume is inversely related to pressure. I mean, get your head out of your sphincter. But there is only one condition. The temperature has to remain constant. Okay, we get it, because the temperature inside our body is about 37 degrees Celsius, so it's constant. So Boyle's Law work in your lung and in my lung and in every other lung. So if you control the volume of gas delivered by a ventilator, the pressure is going to adjust accordingly, according to Boyle's Law. As long as the temperature remains constant, which is a given, and as long as the lung compliance does not change. There is a whole difference between a lung that's very easy for you to expand, such as a patient with emphysema, and a lung that's fibrous, such as in a patient with interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, this lung is as stiff as a male copulatory organ in the pre-orgasmic phase. The compliance is dismal, but emphysema has excellent compliance. I've talked about this before in my video called lung pressures, but in brief, here is the lung volume. On inspiration, you bring volume into your lungs called common sense. <sighs> volume is increasing. During expiration, you get the air out. <sighs> volume is decreased. If you didn't understand this, there is no hope for you understanding anything else. Okay, next, let's go to a more sophisticated stuff, intrapulmonary or intraalveolar pressure. It starts to become negative. Negative pressure sucks in stuff. It starts sucking air in. Air is coming in to 
try to make this pressure back to zero. So first you get this pressure negative. <gasps> negative pressure sucks air in. Sucking the air in will increase the pressure back to zero. We get it. During expiration is the opposite. Your diaphragm is going up and your abdominal muscles are contracted. <laughs> get this air out. The pressure is increasing and the volume is decreasing. Have you noticed that when the pressure decreased, the volume increased according to Boyle's law? I was not joking. Here is the ventilator. Oh, no, 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 no. Shut up. It's very easy. Here is your volume. Here is your pressure first. Okay, let's say that we set the PEEP at, let's say, 5, which means the alveolar pressure do not fall below 5. So we start from this baseline, which is fine. Patient triggered the vent. Translation, the patient is doing the heavy lifting by creating a negative pressure to suck in stuff. Now, the volume of air starts rushing into the patient's lung, and this will increase the pressure inside the lung, okay, because the lung is being inflated with pressure. Next, the, before you know it, the air is coming out of the patient's lung and the pressure is decreasing as well. Next cycle, the patient gets the pressure to negative because the patient is doing the heavy lifting. Negative pressure sucks the air in. <gasps> see this, see this very sophisticated stuff? That negative pressure was created first, then the volume started rushing in next. Okay, not the other way around. Very sophisticated stuff. Next, and it's the same thing oh, again and again and again. But look at this. Where is the negative pressure here? Okay, because here the patient did not trigger the ventilator. The machine started by itself. The patient was comatose or drowsy or for whatever reason did not trigger the breath. But that's why we have a mechanical ventilator to save the day. The machine will start from itself, pew, punching air in and then out. So when you see negative deflection like this, it means the patient started the ventilator or triggered the ventilator. When you see a positive deflection like this, it means the patient did not start, but the machine did. Next, negative deflection. Translation, the patient triggered the vent. Okay, look at this. The pressure was here, but suddenly it's here. It increased. This is called volume control. I'm setting the volume and I'm looking at the pressure. When the pressure starts increasing, it means the compliance is doing what? decreasing. If the pressure increased too much, an alarm will go off and the doctor will find his Ferrari keys, which is ironic. So here is the ventilator mode. AC it means assist control. This is a volume control. 14 is the respiratory rate. Tidal volume is 500. Here is the tidal volume 500. FiO2 is 40%. How much oxygen would like to deliver? PEEP is 5. This is the pressure below which we do not let it. That's like this. Okay, the patient does not, oh, we'll start from five. So this is your baseline. What is the maximum volume here? It's called the tidal volume. That's what you set at 500. And the tidal volume is the volume going into your lung and out of your lung during normal quiet breathing. A negative deflection means the patient triggered the vent. A positive deflection means the machine triggered the breath, not the patient. Pressure increased because compliance is decreasing. This is bad news. It cannot get easier than this, except it can. We'll talk about the flow. To understand the flow, the best analogy is acceleration. You love cars, I do. All right, so we'll start at zero. This car starts from zero, which was means the car is stopping, and then it went to 100 kilometers per hour. This is called accelerating. We draw a curve like this. Then the car maintained its speed like this. So the curve is like this. Some of you will look at this and say, oh, the curve is not increasing. It means the car has stopped. Just shut up. It means the car is not increasing its speed. It's maintaining its speed, but it's moving at 100 kilometers per hour. Get your head out of your sphincter. Then the, heart, the, the car will start to decelerate until it reaches zero. And then for some reason that I don't understand, the driver get it into reverse mode and start backing up to the opposite direction. Now the curve is going below the baseline and back to zero. Acceleration is delta V over delta T. Delta V here is the velocity. Now, flow is the same flipping thing. Flow is delta V over delta T, except V here is not velocity, it's volume. I mean, look at this. It looks exactly like the acceleration curve of the stupid car. All right, so here, the patient triggered the vent. Air start rushing in. So the flow of air is starting increasing. <gasps> Then the flow of air is starting, it's still getting in, but the rate is not increasing. But this means the air is coming in, but it's just a constant rate. It's not increasing, but the air is rushing in. 
then the air starts decreasing its rushing in but it's still going into the patient's lung and then the air starts going outside of the patient's lung until we go to the baseline again so here is zero here is increasing flow going into the patient here we maintain the flow rate here we're decreasing the flow still the air is coming into the patient this is flow going out here is air going out of the patient this is expiration until we reach the baseline after all of this if you got the exam question wrong just blame yourself peak pressure versus plateau pressure from the previous curve you remember the purple line yes that's the pressure it looks like this i was over simple simplistic in the previous slide but it's actually like there is a notch here peak pressure versus plateau pressure what is the peak pressure peak pressure when the air is moving in during inhalation at its maximum we call this peak and the maximum is usually reached mid inspiration then it starts to plateau like if you remember the flow curve maximum peak plateau and then back all right so here look at this graph where is the maximum where is the peak it's from here all the way to here this is called peak pressure where is the plateau pressure it's here from here to here this is plateau pressure because now we are plateauing in this area this area is plateauing okay that's easy what determines the peak pressure the airway resistance so if you have a change in peak pressure it means there is a change in airway resistance period end of issue let's talk about plateau pressure plateau pressure is here when the air stops moving in it's actually between inhalation and exhalation i made a mistake here so here is the flow curve again all right flow increase and then flow starts the rate starts to decrease and then it goes below the baseline like this and then up the baseline again and repeat the same freaking thing from here to here this is inspiration from here to here this is expiration between them there is a plateau so to, to draw it perfectly it's gonna be like this all right inhalation to exhalation this is normal but in some people it's gonna be like this inhalation and then plateau and then exhalation what increased the plateau here it's the lung compliance baby the lung compliance is deteriorating that's why plateau pressure is increasing so let's say that the peak pressure is increasing what does that mean it means that the airway resistance is increasing which is bad news let's say that the plateau pressure is increasing what the flip does that mean the lung compliance is deteriorating which is horrible so when you are controlling the volume and keeping an eye on the pressure the alarm will go off when the pressure rises above a certain limit if this happened the next step is to ask yourself is the problem in the peak pressure or the plateau pressure if the problem is in the peak pressure this is an airway problem if the problem is in the plateau pressure that's a lung compliance issue when the peak pressure increases it means the airway resistance has increased when the plateau pressure increases it means the lung compliance has decreased both of these are bad so here is the baseline let's call it a here is condition b and condition c all right here is the peak pressure from here to the peak and here is the plateau pressure from the baseline to the plateau now here is b tell me what happened what changed did the peak pressure change or the plateau pressure please pause and the answer is it's the peak pressure that has increased look at this peak man it has increased dramatically how about the plateau still the same so it's increased peak pressure translation what has changed it's increased airway resistance okay let's say we have a patient with bronchial asthma increased bronchoconstriction and bronchial secretion will increase the airway resistance and therefore increase the peak pressure now let's go to see what happened what did change is it the plateau pressure or the peak pressure please pause and the answer is it's the plateau pressure baby the peak pressure did not change same peak pressure like this peak but look at this plateau pressure man look at this because the, look at this part it has diminished diminished because the plateau pressure has increased now the plateau pressure has increased translation lung compliance has deteriorated let's say that we have a patient with pneumothorax will that increase the plateau pressure you bet because it decreases lung compliance it's difficult to expand this lung when there is pneumothorax 
Let's say we have a patient with pulmonary edema. Same freaking thing. Decreased compliance and increased plateau pressure. Here are the conditions that increase the peak pressure and here are the conditions that increase the plateau pressure. What increases the peak pressure? Anything that increases airway resistance. What increases plateau pressure? Anything that decreases lung compliance. Okay, plateau pressure. Bronchial asthma or bronchospasm. You are constricting your bronchial, increasing the airway resistance, raising the peak pressure. Increased mucus secretion, same, same thing, increases airway resistance and increases peak pressure. Occlusion of the tip of the endotracheal tube. Absolutely. What decreases the lung compliance and therefore increase plateau pressure? Tension pneumothorax because there is air surrounding the lung and it's, the lung is cannot expand easily, so decrease compliance. Pulmonary edema for the same freaking reason. Pneumonia because of all of the gunk in the alveolus called consolidation. Air day is called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Do you think the lung is compliant? Shut up. There is a big difference between pulmonary ventilation and alveolar ventilation. Pulmonary is the same thing as minute ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation is just the respiratory rate times the tidal volume. But alveolar ventilation, which is actually what matters, is respiratory rate multiplied by the tidal volume minus the dead space because the dead space is not involved in gas exchange. As you know, shallow rapid breathing like this, <laughs> you are not helping yourself. You're just ventilating your dead space like an idiot. I'm sorry, forgive my language. Deep, slow breathing like a wise man increase the alveolar ventilation. <sighs> so much wisdom. So here is subject A, which is normal, patient B, patient C. Patient B has increased respiratory rate, patient C has increased the tidal volume. Let's see which one is better for the alveolar ventilation, which is actually what matters. Pulmonary ventilation, this person, 12 times 500, 6 liters. Alveolar ventilation, just subtract that in space, which is about 150, you get 4.2 liters. Patient B, when you increase the respiratory rate like this, <laughs> pulmonary ventilation, same 6 liter, but alveolar ventilation, 1.5 liters. This is horrible if you compare it with 4.2. But let's look at increased tidal volume. Still, the pulmonary ventilation or the minute ventilation is 6 liters, but the alveolar ventilation is 5.1 freaking liter. That's a wise man. Therefore, increasing the tidal volume is way better than increasing the respiratory rate if you care about the alveolar ventilation, which is actually what matters. Increasing the tidal volume is a better way to achieve more alveolar ventilation than increasing the respiratory rate. But everything has pros and cons. Within limits, baby. If you increase tidal volume too much, the alveoli will go like this. Here is normal alveoli. Expanding like this and then deflating like this. And then expanding like this and then deflating like this. This bizarre motion can lead to inflammation. If you raise the respiratory rate too much, it's too bad. If you raise the FIO too, too much, it's too bad. If you increase PEEP too much, it also has problems. So let's start with respiratory rates. If you increase respiratory rate too much, too bad. Why? In obstructive lung disease, asthma or COPD, what's the definition of obstructive lung disease? I cannot get the air out. Please leave me alone. Give me some time to get every drop of the air out because I'm struggling on exhalation. If you increase the respiratory rate, the patient did not have time to empty his lung completely, but the second cycle came. And the next cycle came before the patient can empty his lung. And the next cycle. And the next cycle. This is called breath stacking. You're stacking air on top of air, on top of air, on top of air. They also call it O2 peep. Positive and expiratory pressure, but it's O2. The patient did it to himself. It's not actually the patient, it's the stupid doctor, but this is the name. Raising FiO2 too much is also bad. Why? Have you heard of hyperbaric oxygen injury? It's called barotrauma, baby, because baro means pressure, because it leads to bronchitis. And in premature babies, when you give too much oxygen, it can lead to retinopathy of prematurity and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is horrible. Pros and cons of PEEP. Pros, it keeps the alveolar open at the end of expiration, therefore more oxygenation. Awesome, but everything has cons. It makes the intrapleural pressure positive instead of negative, which will decrease the venous return, decrease cardiac output, and decrease the blood pressure, as I've told you in my previous videos. So when you decrease the venous return and blood starts pooling, can you expect ankle edema? Absolutely yes. Too much of anything can be bad for you. Too much respiratory rate, air stacking or O2P, beware in patients with asthma or COPD. If you increase the tidal volume too much, the alveoli will go like this and like this and like this. This increase inflammation, beware in ARDS. 
FiO2, oxygen injury, baby, it can lead to bronchitis. Too much PEEP, decreased venous return, decreased cardiac output, and hypotension. There are no solutions in life, only trade-offs, said the great Dr. Thomas Sowell. He was talking about the mechanical ventilation. <laughs> You give your order for the ventilation. I need an assist control as my mode, and I will control four parameters. Let's say the respiratory is 14, tidal volume is 500, FiO2 is 40%, PEEP is 5. 1 and 2 control, PCO2. 3 and 4 control, PO2. What if you have a patient with a respiratory acidosis? Increase 1 and 2. What if you have a patient with hypoxemia? Increase 3 and 4. Especially if the patient has CHF, because in CHF, the heart has failed. The heart is overwhelmed, and you are trying to... Peep, increase peep. Increase peep will decrease the venous return. In this case, it's actually good because the heart is already overwhelmed. Don't push blood on him, he's struggling. Decreasing the venous return is actually beneficial in a patient with CHF. It's beneficial to the heart. Yes, you will suffer from ankle edema, but who cares? Your heart is more important than your little toe. But increasing PEEP too much, as you know, is bad if you have hypotension. Therefore, you should get your vital signs before you order PEEP, you stupid doofus. My favorite part of the lecture. During endotracheal intubation, the doctor extends the neck. Beware of atlantoaxial subluxation. You need to take history. If there is history of rheumatoid arthritis, oops, stop, stop. Triggering the vent is a phrase that means controlling the work of breathing. When we say the patient is quote, triggering the vent, it means the patient is starting the breathe on his own. Riding the vent, it means the patient is sedated and the ventilation is actually doing the work of breathing and the patient is just riding the tide. Spontaneous respiratory rate is the rate of breathing or the respiratory rate when the machine is doing the work. In CHF, the heart is not pumping, blood is pulling behind the overwhelmed heart. PEEP is actually good because it decreases venous return and decreases the overwhelmingness. Too much English in this lecture. If a patient has ARDS, restrictive lung disease with low compliance, you should increase PEEP and decrease tidal volume. If a patient has emphysema, you should increase the inspiratory flow rate, make sure that the flow reaches zero at the end of expiration to prevent breath stacking or O2 PEEP. Okay, we get this part. Why increase the inspiratory flow rate? Normally, here is inspiration, here is expiration. This is one-third and this is two-thirds. This is normally. In a patient with an obstructive lung disease, such as a patient with emphysema, there is a problem. They cannot get the air out. There is prolonged expiration and they need it to get the air out. So don't increase the rate too much. But you can increase this inspiratory flow rate so that they can inhale from here to here. You will deliver all the air from here to here vigorously so that you leave the patient with lots of time to empty his lung to the last drop before the next cycle begins. Genius. As you know, everything in life has trade-offs. There are no solutions. Complications of mechanical ventilation, barotrauma, ventilation-associated lung injury, ventilator-associated pneumonia or VAP, translation. It's a pneumonia that you develop after 48 to 72 hours after being intubated and mechanically ventilated. If it started like within one hour after the ventilator and you have pneumonia, this is not ventilator associated. Do not blame the machine. What organisms cause ventilator associated pneumonia? It depends on how soon after admission was the patient intubated. Okay. If the intubation took place within one to four days after admission to the hospital, same organism as community-acquired pneumonia, because this is a community-acquired pneumonia, do not blame the hospital, do not blame the machine. So it's streptococcal pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, klebsiella, etc. And these organisms are usually not drug-resistant, which is awesome. More than five days after admission, organisms are found in the hospital. Now you blame the hospital, not the community. Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, MRSA, etc. These are usually drug resistance called MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Those bacteria are communists. Here's an exam question. Very important. Patient was endotracheally intubated and mechanically ventilated. Then three days later, he developed a new fever. 104. Leukocytosis. Lung infiltrates on radiology. A cough productive of purulent sputum. Diagnosis. Classic case of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Organism. Look at the time frame. Three days. Okay. So blame the community. This is a community-acquired kind of pneumonia, but we call it... Uh, uh. It's similar to community acquired pneumonia, so strip pneumo, hemophilus, influenza, or klebsiella. Predisposing factors. Malnutrition in the ICU is the most common predisposing factor. 
which samples are the best to culture if you want to get the organism the deepest the deeper you go into the patient's lung the better culture you'll get what's the best modality to obtain cultures called protected specimen brush or psb via bronchoscopy why is it good it goes deep which is good better culture it's unlikely to be contaminated by flora how to treat ventilator associated pneumonia empirically before the culture results come back it depends on the timeline within one to four days after the admission i'm thinking about strep pneumo antibiotics against those guys beta lactam plus a respiratory fluoroquinolone but if more than five days okay i'm thinking pseudomonas and MRSA and all of this ugly stuff add two anti-pseudomonal antibiotics just like go all in plus vancomycin or linozolid to cover the stupid MRSA I hope you learned something in this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell to get notified. Follow me on Facebook. I have more than 100 cases there. And smash like, by the way. You can get my Dropbox notes, which include the slides of this video, organized notes, PDF notes, cases, audio notes, and they are organized in beautiful Dropbox folders. Just go to patreon.com slash medicosis. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Channels, where medicine makes perfect sense.